Bertolt Brecht wrote of the murdered socialist Rosa Luxemburg. She told the poor hey, what life is about, and so the rich have rubbed her out. As the students I teach in the New Jersey prison system are acutely aware, all empires die in the same act of self-immolation. The tyranny that the Athenian Empire imposed on others, Thucydides noted in its history of the Peloponnesian War, it finally imposed on itself. To fight back, to reach out, and help the weak, the oppressed, and the suffering, to save the planet from ecocide, to destroy the domestic and international crimes of the ruling class. And you're very welcome. Thank you all for coming. To live in truth, to spat graven images, is to bear the mark of Cain. Those in power must feel our wrath, which means acts of sustained, nonviolent, civil disobedience, social and political disruption. <laughs> Organized power from below is the only power that can save us. Politics is a game of fear, and it is our duty to make those in power very, very afraid. The ruling oligarchy has locked us in its death grip. It cannot be reformed. It obscures and falsifies the truth. It is on a maniacal quest to increase this obscene wealth and unchecked power. I'm introducing Robin Lloyd and Duncan Nichols, um, uh, two of the organizers uh, of this event, uh, which is in observation of the demonstration which is happening in Washington, D.C., and which is playing on the TV uh, in the next room. So I would like to ask you, um, uh, what has motivated your idea about forming a new party to uh, an an a new anti-war party? Coalition. Coalition. Yeah, we're not forming a party, but... Okay, a new anti-war coalition. Well, oh, well then that, maybe that's the first question. Yeah. What exactly uh, is, the, is, is, the, is the constitution of this coalition? Who are, who are the members of this coalition? Totally, the organization is totally amorphous as for now, but today is an important meeting to bring left and right together in Vermont to deal with this crisis that is facing the world. And, you know, every night on TV, you see more people being shot and killed and, and missiles flying in all directions. And the United States is providing so much of that uh, ordinance for Ukraine. We are against that. We want to stop the war. We want... Uh, uh, negotiations, and I think a lot of people feel that way. In fact, I'm hoping that today will be a upsurge, a blossoming of anti-war uh, initiatives around the country. So, don't you agree? Yeah, I do. <laughs> of course. Uh, well, the question again was why? Why are we here? What was the question you just asked? The, you the, uh, who are the members of the board? Oh, okay, I think Robin described that pretty well. Really what was going on for us was that Nancy Rice and Robin and I and others, Joseph Gainza and others in Vermont, have been talking about doing an anti-war coalition of some kind. And so that's already sort of got started, and then Robin contacted Olga, and we said, okay, let's throw our, what do they say, throw your... Uh, throw your valises in with everybody here. Because the, the Libertarian Party, the Vermont Libertarian Party, is very fired up about being anti-war. And, and Ron Paul and all their leaders are, are saying great things. So we need to work together because the Democrats and the Republicans have a lock on everything, and particularly in Vermont. So we'd like Vermont to not be a, a it's becoming, a, we feel like a military base. The F-35 is now deployed in Europe, 
and the F-35 is deployed in the south, you know, Israel has the F-35 airplane. Uh, they're nuclear capable. So, uh, but we feel like Vermont is our home and that we need to have a, a concerted and uh, wide coalition in Vermont to deal with the powers that be. Mm -hmm. With these liberal uh, think tanks and, and uh, the neocons are all in lockstep and, and we have to resist. Mm -hmm. For example, uh, one of the initiatives that we might support is uh, protect the guard. By protect the guard, we mean don't send them out on uh, wars that have not been formally announced by the president. And the president is very uh, cherry about declaring war. And war hasn't been declared. I mean, war was not declared in Vietnam, right? Yeah. So all of these wars have just been a kind of a upsurge from the from the dark side, from the um, the pro militaristic people in the Pentagon and so on, and that they have not been supported by the people. So this would be a way to protect the guard yeah. by uh, giving them the option to not go. Yeah. So there's the guard in the state house. That's one thing that might be introduced is that legislation to protect the guard from being deployed anywhere outside of Vermont that isn't declared as a declared war. And that's what Robin just described. But the other thing we can continue to do is to have the resolution to have no nuclear delivery systems in Vermont, which was almost made it the last few years. There's a lot of organizing around that. So we want to put pressure on Vermont politicians and the governor, and we think this is a national, this event today is a national event, and we just want to be part of a bigger, you know, probably worldwide, you know, movement to stop war. You know, end war. Mm -hmm. end, end war. war. Yeah. <laughs> end war. Yeah. So we're willing to work with anybody and we hope that anybody is willing to work with anybody when it comes to this, because the consequences are massive, you know, with the nuclear threats and these weapons and the military industrial complex. It's gotten too big. So do you feel that this issue, this crisis issue, is a moment when the left and the right might actually be able to meet each other and begin to end the massive polarization which we're experiencing in this country as well as in the entire planet mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, for example, out there, we're listening to Ron Paul, who is uh, a uh, very active libertarian person in Congress, and, and he's against war, he's against sending our weapons overseas when we, there's so much here we need to do. And so I think there's a genuine uh, potential of coming together, and this, this is a unique moment. I, I'm really excited about today and what follows from today. Yeah, yeah, and, and your question about um, uh, polarization is a key question. And I think underneath the subtext to all of this is about the polarization. Because with the polarization is, a, is becomes the weak, the weakness of our movements is the polarization. That's the whole point of the polarization. So we're there to point that out. Um, and you know, we're forming. So we would like people, we'd like to know what other people think. Mm. Yeah, you know, we're not other, coming out with the rules. There are <laughs> huge groups. I mean, the uh, Extinction Rebellion, the youth, youth people, or they are fired up. 350.org just held a great demonstration here last weekend, and uh, but but so uh, us anti-war folks reaching out to the environmental folks and coming together there is an obvious marriage that should take place. <laughs> and yet somehow it, it's not always stressed that, yeah. you know, the F-35s are the greatest contaminator of, of uh, Vermont airspace of anything. An environmental polluter and the military. Yeah. Not yeah. just the United States military, but all these militaries. 
Yeah. They're, they're the number one polluter, apparently. Some people have done the research. So we all need to work together. But I, I think your question about polarization and the antidote to polarization is, is really the key question here. It's not so much which war we stop, but how we come together and have common sense together and live together. Yeah. And, and you have hope that this effort will, will go some way in banning nuclear weapons? Sure. Say you have hope. <laughs> yeah. Say you have hope. Yeah, absolutely, because 120 countries have already done that. They've already made it law, and it's already in force in the UN, the second year in force. So that means it's being practiced, it's a law, it's international. Just the countries that haven't signed are the nuclear countries. So the hope is that we're going to influence them. And we can. It's a good start on it. The, uh, what's a treaty to ban nuclear? Is it TPNW? Treaty? Yeah, yeah. You're looking it up. Well, it, it's... So, it, I, there's a lot of good things in the works. There's a lot of irons in the fire that are good, including some things to protect the guard, you know, protect uh, our troops. I mean, the 101st Airborne apparently is already in Ukraine. So that was, that was six months ago. So it's already in process. So the question about hope is a really good question because it's easy to not have hope. That's easy. It's hard to have hope. And therefore, you have to do something. You have to write your senator, you know, and say, come on, we want you to do the right thing. You know, be responsible. And that's where our hope is, I so common the, sense. Yeah, there's currently uh, no bill in, in, in possible progress in the State House about banning uh, the F-35s in, in Vermont? No, it has to be revived because it's a new biennium starting this year. Mm -hmm. So um, it would have to be reintroduced and there are some people who are talking about that. Mm. Yes. And so it's a good, it would be a great thing and we'll get behind it. Okay. Yeah. Did you want to say something? Well, uh, I, I was just looking up the uh, number of diseases that are predominant in people who live downstream from uh, nuclear weapons tests and that have proliferated around the country whether you live near them or not and uh, it's just uh, it's just amazing what uh, you know and of course now it's gone away oh here it is but you know leukemia cancer of the pharynx uh, of the small intestine of the brain cancer of the stomach of the uni uni urinary bladder of the colon I mean, these uh, people are being killed by our government's obsession to uh, be the most powerful country in the world by making so many more nuclear weapons than are ever needed. I mean, no weapons, nuclear weapons are needed, but the stockpile of weapons, and the stockpile means the uh, the um, mining of uranium, which injures the Indian people, where where most of the uranium is on their plantations, and then the refining and the whole the waste process is, is the waste is going around in trains right now. Yeah, it's incredible. The waste is going How around in trains every day. This? this nuclear waste. So we need to just uh, call it out, you know, and be responsible. Um, yeah, some people say, Robin said to me, uh, would you rather be alive after a nuclear exchange or dead? You know, so that's, it might yes. be better not to be alive because it's a terrible thing. Terrible thing. Even small nukes. Yeah. They're, 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 they're making some big, big mistakes talking about small yeah. nukes. Okay, well, thank you for your interview. Okay, well, well thank you very much. Anything yeah. else you want to say to wrap this up? Okay. I think, right, I think we've you. said it. We better go talk to people. Yeah. My name is Olga Maria. I'm the chair of the Libertarian Party of Vermont. Hi, Olga Maria. Uh, glad to meet you. Uh, so, as a reporter, I'm wondering if this anti-war movement 
that is a coalition of forces between progressives and libertarians might be a moment in our country when we can actually begin to deal with the polarization that we have experienced for some years now, and which is not only an American phenomenon, but a global phenomenon. Um, what, um, what words um, might you be able to say about that? I absolutely think that's exactly what's happening. Um, for a really long time now, the body politic in our culture has taken a role of dividing everyone in such a way and driving a culture war, which is driving a wedge between everyone. And I think the wonderful thing about this coalition that is being built, not only in Vermont, but around the country, and honestly around the world, um, between folks that on most issues maybe are on opposite sides or um, miss understand or, or even have misconceptions of one another. I think that the wonderful thing about this moment is that it's truly an issue where we are understanding the dire nature of where we are in the history of the world right now. Um, we have an elite class that has taken us through the last three years of tyranny in a lot of countries, including ours, and continues this drive of authoritarianism, essentially, and is pushing this nation really to the brink of disaster and the world to the brink of disaster. And I think so many folks just coming out on the other end of the past couple of years are really sick and tired of the authoritarian nature of the elites at this point and are looking on the other side of the proverbial aisle to say, what can we do together at this point? Because whatever our differences are, they're really not the most important thing right now. We can argue about Medicare for all or a free market healthcare system another time. Let's get through what is happening right now so that we can have those discussions. Because at the rate that we're going and at the rate that our president and a lot of the quote unquote leaders around the world, they're really not interested in the things that affect working people and the things that affect human beings. They're more interested in feeding this war machine. And the other side of this war machine isn't only the military actions that take place overseas, it's the surveillance state. And I think that's the other piece that people are really putting together is how much the militarization um, uh, you know, that we see across, the, across the, the globe, how much that militarization is actually being weaponized and used here. Yes, thank you very much. Um, what, uh, how do you feel about the issue of Vermont housing F-35s and how that affects the nuclear balance uh, uh, in the world and particularly in this particular moment of crisis? I think this situation right now with the war in Ukraine the um, essentially a proxy war with the United States and Russia um, has really changed the way we are looking at the issue locally in Vermont with the F-35s. Prior to any of this happening, a lot of the arguments were, you know, the pollution, the sound, the way it impacts folks here who live near the, the Air Force Base, uh, the airport where, you know, the, the, the planes are flying. Now we're looking at things in a really different way. Um, and I think that that's an important point of conversation for us to start having, because it is what this, it's bringing to light, what is this actually being used for? What are these things being used for? The other thing that we're looking at here is um, our National Guard. There's an initiative that we're working on, it's called Defend the Guard. And basically that's, about, that's an initiative um, it's a national group that is uh, started by veterans. They are anti-war veterans, and this initiative is designed for states and for groups like ours, excuse me, for, for groups like ours to bring to our state house, to find sponsors, to propose a bill that would not allow the governor to send our National Guardsmen unless there's an official declaration of war by Congress. 
It's a form of nullification that we could potentially have in this state that other states are working on, a form of trying to at least decentralize some of the military hold. And it's these types of conversations that we can have locally around our local military and how they're used. Um, and, and what the effect of that is overseas. I think we've been so disconnected from that. Um, we don't see anywhere in our, you know, on the mainstream media or even the local media, no one knows about what's happening in Yemen. No one knows about what's happening in Syria. And it's interesting, the United States military is all over the globe engaged in all types of conflicts. Um, and yet we only have a spotlight on the particular ones that are able, where they're able to drive the emotionality of people, where they're able to drive the narrative. And I think the positive thing that this is doing, the gathering that we're having today, and the coalition that we're starting is that it's engaging people to really learn about what really is happening on this larger scale. We have no idea how engaged um, the military is, how engaged the Pentagon is, um, how engaged all the tax dollars that are taken from us and that are utilized to fund the Pentagon. Um, and to fund all of these things all over the world. And the effects that they're having in creating um, genocide and atrocities that we, we can't even imagine. And the media is not even reporting on it. Well, that's very interesting. What you've just said really shows bridge building between the progressives uh, and the libertarians. And uh, I, I, I congratulate you on that. I congratulate both sides. In fact, um, the uh, Duncan uh, was just talking about the bills, uh, the, the same bill about the guards uh, mm -hmm. in the state house. So the, there's there's a place of utter total agreement uh, on, mm -hmm. on supposedly both sides here. So maybe there are two sides. Maybe there. there I there think. Is yeah, really I think. A co coalition. The trick in, of the formation. The trick of the duopoly of the Democrats and Republicans, of liberals, conservatives, the trick of it, it's really it's one party that just has two tastes, two different flavors of authoritarianism. Which one do you like? I don't like any of those flavors. And I think a lot more people who are aligning themselves, whether it's the, with the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, are really starting to realize that these are two sides of the same authoritarian bird and they're sick of it. And so they're kind of stepping out, they're becoming independents, they just want to focus on, on, or on coalitions, they want to focus on issues because they are becoming way more aware that the two sides, they, they, they talk a lot, but when we look at what the, the Democrat and the Republicans agree upon, um, especially when we look at these, 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 major, these major bills that are passed um, in DC, um, it's very scary. When they are in agreement, we need to run. <laughs> when they are in agreement, we're in a lot of trouble. Um, and all the other, you know, talking points back and forth that they have about, you know, this side is this and this side is that, that's all just to distract us. And that's all to, to drive us into their identitarian conflicts and for us to just divide ourselves. And I think this is why this event um, is very scary. This coalition is scary because um, we're trying to rise above it and transcend that. And we're trying to just say, let's focus on what we can do to work together. Because it really is a lot more that we agree upon than we, than we think. It's great to hear. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Hello everyone, I'm glad to see you here. As you can see, we're in the midst of a public meeting the protest, uh, the anti-war protest, which is joined by both parties, by the Libertarian Party and Progressive Party. This is a very interesting development.
model of today is to watch some of this live stream from Washington, D.C., which is the Libertarian Party and the People's Party uh, event. And it's pretty well, uh, it's certainly got wonderful speakers, and we want to hear some of them, but we also want to talk amongst ourselves and get some ideas of where we might, you know, work in Vermont to stop war and stop this militarism. There's a lot of very active people in this room. So in a little while, we'd like to all stop uh, other things and just have a, a conversation. Now, how, whether do people think we should be in a circle? Do they think we should be, you know, in one uh, small area? How do people see that? Because we have this competing and, con and, and, and parallel event here. Turn what do people off. think? There's also, there's also a room in there if people wanted to kind of just sit. So some people did want to listen, but people wanted to keep talking. There's also a, a nice room in there, too, if people just wanted to do that. Or however you guys feel like it'll work better. Okay, so that's an option is to go in this room. It's a lovely room. Yeah, right. um, but then that means everybody has to go in there who want to meet. I have a feeling, Robin maybe has a sense of this, Robin Lloyd, that we want to talk yeah. without other things going on for a little while anyway. Yeah. Because what we're doing here is we're really going to the next step, which is to form a wider Vermont coalition, which includes any party that is in it, and they include us and all of us, and so it's a step. And so the next thing we'll do is we'll, we'll have a meeting, a follow-up meeting on March 16th in the evening on a Zoom, and we'll continue. We want to hear what people think what they want, where their heads are at, where they think we should go, whether they, they believe in consensus, or they want to, we all just want to get things done fast. You know, we want to hear everybody's opinion, okay? Uh, the, 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 um, the Libertarian Party is one of the hosts, and I would say Nancy, Robin Lloyd, Nancy Rice, Robin Lloyd and I are kind of helping organize, and Renee, is helping organize this other post-ishness. And so that's the Vermont Anti-War Coalition. And that's why we want to hear where you want to take organizing in Vermont against war. So it's forming, it's just kind of uh, being birthed a little bit here. So we have a questionnaire and we hope you'll go talk to whoever's at that table, Nancy or me yeah. or Robin, and, uh, and, and, and sign in and Give us your emails, and we'll contact you again. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to welcome everyone um, to this event. I think it's wonderful that um, we're all here meeting and talking and listening. And yeah, it sounds a little bit wonky, so maybe that's kind of like the university's way of saying, you know, talk amongst yourselves and get to know one another, enjoy some good food. Yeah. Um, but I think what's happening right now, this moment, is very momentous and historical. What's happening right now in Washington, D.C. is the largest anti-war gathering in at least 20 years. And I think what we're doing here in Vermont is equally historic. There are sister events like this one that are happening all over the country today and this whole weekend. So we're really in good company. And I think the importance um, of the fact that, you know, we're all folks on, on different sides and different places of the political spectrum, um, and we're able to still kind of gather and break bread and talk amongst ourselves and plan and all that, and I think that's great. So I just want to welcome everyone, and when you get a chance, just make sure you signed in, sign in to the Libertarian Party table, sign in, make sure you fill out that questionnaire, because um, what we're trying to do is just gather information and see where we can take this, um, where we can take this movement, honestly, is what really we're just trying to build together. Jerome Lafani. Uh, is public access TV, and he's asked me to ask all of you if there's people who would rather not be filmed, and he can avoid that. He's just taking various interviews with people individually. So can everybody hear that question? So if you don't want to be filmed, raise your hand. Okay, there's enough here. So Jerome, are you here? I'm right here. What do you think? 
You're gonna. I can tur turn off the camera at any moment. <laughs> okay. We don't. I don't have to be filming this public part yeah. at all. Well, you're doing uh, interviews with people, and. Okay, good. I'll do okay. that. I'm glad to so, do that. So. Uh, yeah, I don't think you need to. I'll, I'll ask you your question. Okay. Uh, greetings, my name is Christopher Halali. I'm the International Secretary of the Party of Communists USA. Our student mass organization, uh, the American Student Union, has uh, co-sponsored uh, this uh, Rage Against the War Machine event here on February 19th. Uh, they're done in DC uh, at this moment, and a lot of great things are happening. Uh, I'm very happy to see a large coalition being built. Uh, very pleased to see uh, organizations on all sides of the political spectrum coming together to fight against the war machine, to call for the abolition of NATO, to call for an end not only to the war in Ukraine, but the wars around the world, uh, and to focus on the human needs first, to focus on the needs of the people in this country and around the world instead of on the war machine and their corporate uh, holders, the stockholders, and uh, the military industrial complex as a whole. So I think overall I'm very pleased that we are finally building uh, an anti-war movement again. Uh, we can see organizations coming together that haven't necessarily been allies before. And I think that this is so good to see something that's a breath of fresh air. And I'm hopeful that in the coming months and in the coming years, we can build a powerful anti-war movement that will be able to go against uh, the US government's role uh, around the world as an empire and as a purveyor of violence and destruction with its war machine to call an end to that and to begin to rebuild uh, a peace movement that can bring about uh, fraternity and solidarity amongst all peoples around the world. That's what I'm hopeful for and that's what we continue to fight for. Thank you very much. So I'm so excited to be here at this meeting today with all these people. This is a, the first real positive meeting uh, against the war. Uh, in Ukraine and calling for uh, for abolishing uh, this tremendous proxy war that's escalating every month. We keep seeing a massive increase in U.S. spending and participation and it's just driving forward uh, to the next, very soon, a next step may be a direct NATO involvement in the war against Russia. This is something that's really very dangerous for humanity and for all of us, so, and for all living things. So we are really fortunate that nationally and here in Vermont, we're seeing people of very different viewpoints coming together to oppose this war, to say, let's stop the war, stop U.S. funding for the war, let's use our money for what we desperately need at home, to rebuild so many things, our infrastructure, affordable housing, child care, our education, our health care, so many things that are in distress at home and we're spending huge resources to, for, to really destroy this, the country of Ukraine. It's doing nobody in Ukraine any good whatsoever to have this war. It's killing and wounding people by the thousands every week. It's not producing a positive result. And we don't need to be involved in where different parts of Ukraine are, what country they're a part of. If the Russian speakers in the eastern Donbass want to be part of their own country or Ukraine or Russia, that's up to them, not us. So if we have any participation in this, it can be to advocate for self-determination by the people in the eastern part of that country. If they, um, 
Otherwise, we're just using their issue to ass and the and the to assault Russia. Where where it's a matter of using the people of Ukraine for our purposes. We want to weaken Russia, according to our sec Secretary of Defense. Well, this is a very dangerous thing to do. What if some they wanted to weaken us and started a war somewhere to weaken us? We've been through that, actually. We were weakened by the Vietnam War. We were weakened by the Afghan War and the Iraq War and all these other wars and interventions that the US has taken on and have served no valuable purpose for the people of Vermont or Michigan or California or anywhere else in our country. It's degraded living in our country to spend trillions of dollars in these wars of aggression. That's what they are, wars of aggression. And so, and then we are assaulting our own people, physical assault on people living in South Burlington, in Winooski, in Burlington, on the east side of Burlington, and in the new north end, and in Williston, with these F-35 jets that are based at our airport, our civilian airport, in a city. Okay, if they were 10 miles away from any populated area, they could be operating without hurting anybody, maybe animal life but at least not people, not children. The Air Force itself said that almost 7,000 people live in the incredible noise danger zone of the F-35, where the noise level reaches 115 decibels, hundreds of times a month, with all of these training flights. This is not for a city any more than dropping napalm would be something you would do in a city. This is military training operations. The military's own regulations prohibit conducting operations in a place where there's a strong possibility of hurting civilians or civilian infrastructure. There are 3,000 homes in that, de in that desperate noise zone. We should be stopping that. This is bringing the war home to our own people. We are making our own Vermonters suffer for the military, as if the military rules us. But that contradicts how this country was established, with civilian rule over the military. We've got to enforce the military's own regulations, help the military conduct its operations in compliance with distinction which means separation of military operations from populated areas, and all the other military regulations that protect civilians. Even during the Vietnam War, there wasn't like a military assault on civilians. The thing that we're seeing here is that it's, that I think they picked Burlington for it because what's near the airport is working class neighborhoods. And they think, oh, they can get away with that. And to some extent, to a large extent, they have. Winooski has the, is, a, is a working class city. It's one mile in direct line with the runway. The, the runway aims right at the center of Winooski. Mm. And it has the most ethnic diversity in Vermont. 30% of the population is non-white. So, and then, of course, in South Burlington, the airport, the runway is located in the Chamberlain School neighborhood, which is an area of these little houses, little houses with backyards, like seven houses to an acre. So it's a really nice area for what they call working, workforce homes. But it's, it was built in the 50s and 60s. It's an area where young people can get, you could get a starter home and build a family and have children. Well, it's dangerous to live there now with this F-35. It's not a good place 
The FAA says it's unsuitable for residential use, and the Air Force says the same thing. You shouldn't be living in that neighborhood. In fact, the Air Force says an area of more than 22,500 uh, acres is in that oval-shaped noise zone. They have contour lines of how the noise goes down with distance. Well, you could see that if you're just a few miles from the runway, you're safe. Why not, if you're going to be doing this, go to a runway in Vermont. There are 18 airports in Vermont. Why not go to one of them that's far away from populated areas? Why not, why use the one in a city surrounded by other cities? South Burlington, Winooski, Burlington, and Williston are all right up against each other and right up against the airport. We have a huge population in that noise zone. But, but it's not just the noise. This F-35 is a nuclear bomb delivery vehicle. It was designed for the purpose of delivering two, F, uh, two B-61 nuclear bombs. This is an airplane which has stealth capability. It's supposed to be able to evade the radar. It's supersonic, faster than the speed of sound. It's designed to get in, drop the bombs, and get out. Well, that makes the Burlington Airport a legitimate military target for Russian and Chinese missiles whether they're nuclear-tipped missiles or conventional. But it's a legitimate military target. And it's not me saying that. It's the Federal Emergency Management Administration that says that. And they have their list of areas that they think will be targeted by nuclear missiles from Russia and China. And, and Burlington Airport is on that list because we have the F-35. And of course, it is a danger for those countries. The F-35s can be forward deployed, and they were for, forward deployed last summer. Eight of them traveled across the Atlantic and did air policing around the borders in Eastern Europe, the borders of Russia. So. And the idea was somehow, and what they promoted that, that tour for three or four months in Eastern Europe was that we're somehow protecting Eastern Europe from Russian advances. They didn't go into Ukraine, fortunately, but they did go in the areas around, in, in the Baltic area uh, and in the other countries in Eastern Europe. So they announced very clearly that Vermont has F-35 jets, they're based here, and they're ready for forward deployment, and they're ready to be upgraded for carrying those nuclear bombs once they are forward deployed. We don't expect them to have nuclear bombs in Vermont and then carry them over the ocean. No, those bombs are already in Europe. So the F-35s would fly over, get the bombs, and then whatever, be deployed if we get to that point. We don't want to get to that point. We want to oppose the F-35 program, the F-35s in Vermont, the drive to escalation and war with Russia or China over Taiwan or any of that. We've had enough of wars of aggression, of regime change wars, of interventions, of overthrowing foreign governments or intervening in their internal affairs. The United States has a record of incredible intervention. And it's up to the people to put a stop to it. We can build a mass campaign. And I'm so excited that so many people have come today to build a movement here in Vermont. And I hope it's happening all around the country. I understand it's not just a demonstration in Washington, D.C., the rage against the war but also on the West Coast, in the Midwest, in the South, all over the country, people are coming out together. Even if they disagree on different things, they're coming out to get together 
to participate. Yeah, we disagree about many other things, but we're united against the war. And we're, we're going to work together to build a campaign to bring in working class people, students, women, gay people, all kinds of different people who are, who are concerned about the escalation of this war, concerned about who's making money from the war, and it's not, it's not us. There are rich people who are just t taking in billions of dollars in weapons sales. We don't need that. We're not, we don't have to have a militarized society. Our main product doesn't have to be war machines. In fact, we have a climate emergency looming over us. And every bomb that is dropped, every missile that is launched, <laughs> takes away from the ability to fight our real enemy, which is climate warming, climate disaster. We don't need to have wars about pipelines. We don't need to be blowing up pipelines or building pipelines. We need to focus on eliminating, over time, our dependence on fossil fuels. Build a renewable uh, um, energy system build a geothermal energy system, build solar and wind and geothermal. These are the things that we could be doing on a mass scale, an industrial scale, to equip every house with renewable energy, every industry, every automobile, every kind of transportation, high-speed rail. What are we wasting our resources on war for? We sh could be doing, instead of destruction, construction. Some of our, some of our what, what the U.S. considers adversaries, like China, they're not wasting on wars. You don't see them intervening. They're building their economy. They're in, they're, they've created wealth for people who were living in poverty. Hundreds of millions of people were in poverty. They've done a lot to up the scale and the standard of living for millions of people, taking them out of poverty, providing education and health care and housing, building cities, building high-speed rail, so many things. They, they're catching up, and we're falling behind because we're focusing on military. It's not the right thing to be doing. We need, well, we had a revolution. We need another one. We need, to re, we need some serious change, some very substantial change in how our country operates. And I think that it's a really amazing thing to see libertarians and progressives and all kinds of other people coming together around one issue. We may only agree on one issue, but that's all you need to agree about to build a movement, and this is a very, very serious issue, and it has, it has impact on many other areas. If we can put a stop to the war uh, focus of our administration and turn this around, we can solve so many other problems. And the differences we have over many other things are inconsequential if we can come together around opposition to this war. Hi there. Uh, my name is Charlotte Dennett, and I am here uh, because I feel that the American people are not being told the whole story about not only what's behind the war in Ukraine, but what's behind all the endless wars that have gone on since 9-11. And uh, I've done some research. Uh, I've written a book, Follow the Pipelines. The subtitle is Uncovering the Mystery of a Lost Spy and the Deadly, Deadly Politics of the Great Game for Oil. And the lost spy is my father. 
um, who was head of um, counterintelligence for the whole Middle East in the World War II and post-war period, and who died in a mysterious plane crash after a top secret visit to Saudi Arabia. So that got me looking into the background, what was he doing, why did the plane crash, uh, and he was involved in Saudi Arabia. So that's, um, that's how I started my quest, which took me, this actually taken me right up to the present and the war in Ukraine. Um, and I, I came here because I wanted to, to educate people. It, it, it's, you have to fight like crazy, first of all. If you are telling an, a narrative that's different than the official narrative, you you got to constantly seek out the alternatives to find people to tell them, look, there's much more to this story. you got to go into historical context. One of my favorite um, uh, influences, I should say, even when I was writing an earlier book on Bush, uh, was a forensic um, pathologist who said, it, he was a, in a major uh, lawsuit, a murder lawsuit, and he said, looking at the facts in isolation will not get you anywhere. Looking at facts in a context, that's when you'll find the proof of what happened. And that's what I do. I trace things historically. But if we come right up to the war in Ukraine, the tip-off for me that this was probably yet another energy war was when I found out that the first U.S. sanction uh, against uh, Russia was the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And that was right at the time of the invasion. And then, of course, what I had to do is look back, you know, what was it about this pipeline that was so threatening? And I found out that it was Russian control and that they were feeding natural gas into Germany and into Europe uh, at a much cheaper rate than the uh, Western com oil companies were trying to deliver their natural gas. So they felt threatened by Russia having what they were worried about is having a monopoly over the energy distri distribution through all of Europe. And uh, so incredibly, um, we have Cy Hirsch has just come out with this incredibly brave article, How America Took Out the Nord Stream Pipeline. And uh, that's been covered up a lot. But he, he had sources who described how this covert operation happened and um, in cooperation with the Norwegians to uh, sabotage the pipeline because there are two pipelines. One was active and the other one was just about to come online when uh, the war happened. And so uh, I started writing about this uh, right at this time, a year ago, and I predicted that the war in Ukraine could easily become the mother of all energy wars. And I feel like I've been sort of uh, vindicated in that. I mean, it, it's inescapable now. The whole oil connection uh, to wars used to be covered up as a national security issue. And the primary reason is because oil continues to be the main fuel of the military. In other words, put differently, it is the military that is the biggest consumer of oil. And the reason that they are so protective of oil is historical le lessons. Namely, Germany ran out of fuel uh, in World War I, and that's why they lost it. And then Hitler became so obsessed in having oil supplies to carry out World War II that he, he developed um, uh, artificial oil and developed a uh, plant to develop it out of IG Farb and it never got very far. But that go goes to show, if you don't control the oil, you lose the war. See? So any, any power that uh, has the ambition of being a great power in the world has to capture oil supplies. And once they get control over the oil, then they have to figure out how to distribute it because it's not going to do anything if it just sits in the ground. So that requires pipelines. Those are the main distributors of oil. All right, if you're going to do pipelines, you've got to figure out how to protect them militarily. 
And one of the um, one of the my father's reports that got declassified because I sued the CIA uh, said right as he was starting out on his mission to the Middle East in 1944, there's this key paragraph about what his tasks were to be. And key among them, we must protect the oil at all costs. And at this point, it was Saudi oil. And the Americans knew this was a prize that was unbeatable. It was the great treasure. And uh, the American allies were very jealous that the U.S. had gotten control over the oil of Saudi Arabia. And now we just fast forward all the way up to the present and look at what Biden had to do uh, when the war in Ukraine began and there was concerns about uh, Europeans not getting access to the oil and natural gas that ran through pipelines that were owned by the Russians, which were built by the Russians when they had control over Ukraine. And so, um, you know, Biden was very concerned. What did he do? He went hat in hand to Saudi Arabia, to Mohammed bin Salman, the prince, the, the acting ruler of Saudi Arabia. And despite all these previous uh, efforts to sanction him and to dis distance him, because he was the guy responsible for the murder of Khashoggi, who was the uh, a, a Saudi dissident and reporter for the wall, uh, for the uh, Washington Post, you know he was he was dismembered. I mean, this shocking murder of this Saudi, uh, and so the CIA even said that he was responsible. So here's Biden, who had called him a pariah, having to go to Saudi Arabia, hat in hand, to try to lower the price of oil and gas. And so um, that's very transparent. It's very out in the open. Um, and all the concerns about Europe and how they're going to get access to natural gas um, to fuel their industries and oil um, culminated in, in, in what we have today with, uh, well, first of all, the, the sabotage of the Nord Stream 2. And what are the implications of that? The implications are that um, that Europe is going to be more and more dependent on U.S. I, some people see this war as actually aimed at weakening Europe, if you can believe that, uh, and particularly Germany, which was going to be the major benefactor of the second Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which was going to terminate in Germany and then be distributed throughout Europe. And so, uh, and I don't see that as inconceivable because one of the things I learned is that investigating uh, the great game for oil that was going on after World War II, it was between the Allies. They were, they were all spying against each other, they were warring against each other, and um, the U.S. was target number one. You know, the, the British were horrendously um, resentful of America getting control over Saudi oil. This suddenly catapulted America into being a great power. So um, on, on the surface, they're allies. But in reality, they're fighting each other. They're spying on each other. And uh, I come to some conclusions in my book about who might have been responsible for the plane crash. And uh, I, I, I strongly suggest that it might be one of the most famous spies of the 20th century. And my father's direct counterpart worked for the British, but unbeknownst to the British, was also working for the Soviets, and that's Kim Philby. He was all very much involved in this area at, the, at this time. But anyway, I learned things. I learned about how uh, espionage is related to scouting for oil and protecting oil routes. And then that in comes the military, so there's that. And then, and then no, no international finance will go near a pipeline plan unless there's stability. So again, that brings in the role of the military that have to make sure that they got the right people to protect the pipeline routes. And I, I find this in Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, and now Ukraine. Were you going to ask me a question? Yes, well. What I've been thinking about when you've been talking about this, going back to Hitler and his losing the war, 
because of not having enough oil. I'm, I'm thinking that the, the modern, the, the current uh, uh, dependence on fossil fuels, it really represents a paragon, a paradigm that, that should be defeated, that needs to be defeated at this point. Completely. Yeah, absolutely. And so we are stuck. Globally, we're stuck in a in in, in this situation that 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 belongs really to history and not to the present needs. Oh. Is not at all supplying the present needs of life on this planet. Oh, you're so right. You're so right. And and I appreciate your your passion on that subject. It, it just drives me crazy because it's 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 traditionally censored. Uh, it's a national security issue. That's what's considered. In fact, uh, I think it was uh, somebody from inside the foreign policy uh, apparatus who was in Rochester, Vermont, and was being filmed by you. And and I had spoken out. We were talking about Ukraine, and I I was talking about yeah, but you never get the oil context. And I said, that's because it's a national security issue. And he agreed with me. So I was glad to get that vindication. It's absolutely true. You will not hear the oil connection to this war. Some type of the New York Times has to talk about the European countries are in a quandary because they were moving away from it. Germany, number one, you know? They, were, they, they had dismantled their uh, nuclear plants and they were all prepared to go first with natural gas. I think they were going into solar in a big way too. And, and this was very threatening to uh, American uh, oil companies. And, and many of them, by the way, during the Trump administration were independents and uh, have been constantly fighting to get their own markets because the majors are the ones that usually get them, Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, BP, Total, you know, the big ones are usually the ones that get the big deals after the little guys first go in and then they buy them out. But the independents uh, based in the Southwest and, and Southern California, uh, they're the ones that have been angling to get in. And the first effort of that angling was the, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And one of the key people that was doing the scouting was Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney of Halliburton. He yeah. was he was eyeing the Caspian Sea, and because they knew that the Caspian Sea was going to be the new release, it's loaded with oil and natural gas. So he was scouting all over and trying to figure out which was the best pipeline routes to get it distributed. And um, so when you look at Ukraine, you got to look at the U Ukraine's location next to the Caspian Sea. Um, and of course, Ukraine, I've got a whole thing in uh, Follow the Pipelines website that shows the whole trail of, of pipelines that are distributing natural gas throughout Europe, and a lot of it was Russian control. Now there's fighting in Azerbaijan uh, with Armenia. The poor Armenians are once again trapped in an almost genocidal situation. And, and, and as I was talking to an Armenian filmmaker, I said, they've got the curse of location. You've got to look at maps. When you look at maps, everything becomes clear. I have 12 maps in this book. And uh, that's when you, you start to understand the energy routes and the competition. Uh, and uh, then, of course, propaganda plays a big role as well. You've got to justify a war. And the last thing you can do is mention that uh, a mother is going to send her, her children to war for oil. It doesn't work. So you've got to come up with a pretext for why, why the war is being fought. And even though it's true that Russia uh, had invaded a sovereign nation, there's more to that story that has to be explored. And um, what, one of the things I found out is that under, uh, for instance, the Obama administration, they knew that the eastern part of Ukraine had the richest uh, reserves, uh, un, uh, as so far unexplored, in the eastern part of Ukraine, where all the fighting's going on right now. And when you, when you see uh, a Biden saying, we'll stay to the end, 
It's not because he cares about Ukraine, I don't think. Maybe he does. But the real objective is to get hold of those resources and prevent Russia from, from getting them. I mean, these are oil wars all the time that are the, going the on. The war in Chechnya was also about oil. Absolutely, and it's in my book. No. I talk about it. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, uh, you wanted to know so, like who, I, who I've met today. Yes. And I, I, I went right to a quote, younger person. He's 38 years old. He had st stood up and said, well, I'm one of the few. There, you know, we're mostly old people. And uh, I said, well, why are you here? His name is Lincoln. <laughs> and um, he, he was telling, I said, What's the, what is it with the young people? Why aren't they involved? And he says, they're too busy looking at their iPhones and, and consuming, and cons they're consuming information. And that's what they're doing. They're, they're like totally addicted uh, to getting, getting uh, whatever, whatever information they want. Uh, and, and they're not they're not paying attention, and um, I find that really really sad. Um, what can we do? And, no. and oh, there are a few people there, and I had to thank one other person who was a bit younger, saying, "I thank you, older people, for for what you've done to try to educate us about these horrific wars that America's have been involved. There are a lot of Vietnam well." quite a few Vietnam vets that were in the room. And to have him actually acknowledge what our generation, we were, we were the 60s generation, the 60s and the 70s, what we tried to do to prevent you know, yet another illegal horrific war and all that we've learned. And, and that's one thing that I think we really need to do is that we need to sit down with younger people and have the conversations that were going on in this room. Um, look, trading ideas about what, where do they get really good information? Because they're just getting a lot of very sophisticated propaganda on the uh, TV. I think, TV and through the internet, and and that's why um, you know you, you've got a lot of people, all of Congress, buying into this. I mean, the whole. The whole thing is around uh, Russia invading a sovereign nation. And uh, I was just talking to one fellow there who, who, who said, well, he's got more information on that, that what was going on in eastern Ukraine at the time is that there were uh, pro-Russian separatists who were getting attacked all the time. That's often not cited. Uh, I do think that, that Putin had an overall uh, imperial objective. I do believe that. And so I condemn him for the invasion. But on the other hand, I condemn the NATO powers and the US for provoking him. They keep calling it an unprovoked war. And all you have to do is go back in history. And when you go back in history and find out when is the origin of the US and NATO countries eyeing you know, the resources of this region, then it all starts to make sense. So do you, do you feel that this very point of view is a place where the progressives can meet the, the, um, the, um, the oh God. The Republican uh, anti-war people? Yes. Yeah. yeah, I do. Sure. I mean, apparently that's what's going on in Washington today. I mean, the, yeah. you've got Rand Paul, for instance, that, that's talking there. And yes, we should be talking, absolutely. Uh, I it's mean, the wonderful whole... that this dialogue has finally begun. Oh, Maybe really? this will, uh, is, the, is the moment that we have needed in order to mitigate the horrible polarization which has been happening in, in exactly. this country over the last few years. Yeah. And it's been intentional, yes. you know, divide and rule. Yes. Uh, yeah, divide I was at a conference, I don't know, two decades ago out on the West Coast where there was the beginning of people coming together to try to understand what was really going on. And there are just a few uh, conservatives there. I, you know, one thing that's common is that, you know, that they're looking at the elites, right? And, and they may be funded by corporations who, like I say, independents, for instance, who are also resentful against the elites. Because the elites are getting all the big deals and they're being shut out, so they're willing to fund 
these uh, grassroots movements, uh, you know, criticizing the elites and the billionaires. And so one of the things that, that people need to understand is who's, who's funding which movements and how uh, the activists are being manipulated. And it's through, it's through the necessity of dialogue and education uh, that we have to get far more sophisticated because the, uh, the stakes are huge. And we're so close, so close to a mistake happening and having a nuclear conflagration. I mean, this, this war is insane. And uh, that's why I'm here. I, I feel, I, I tell people, I say a war on, on both their, the plague on both their houses, really, the Russians and the NATO and US, because their, objects, their objectives are not to protect Ukraine's democracy necessarily. They have to say, Ukraine is a sovereign country, I get that, and, and, and it shouldn't be invaded, but let's look at the whole picture, and I think once we do, um, uh, there will be a reckoning. There will be a reckoning on this war, but at what cost? You know, I, I keep coming back to my father's statement in this, in this heavily redacted document, and somebody forgot to black it out, this one sentence. We have to protect the oil at all costs. What are the costs? And now people tell me, well, it's not just about oil and natural gas, it's about lithium and a lot of minerals in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, which is absolutely true. And lithium, oh my god, now I'm beginning to feel for all the countries that have lithium. What's going to happen to them? And, uh, but, but I keep reminding people that until the U.S. moves away from oil, gasoline, as the fuel of its military machine, we're going to keep having these wars. And, and, and there is a, a consciousness now of how the fossil fuel companies have been lying to us. And I, I've been trying to reach out to these other groups that have come to this consciousness, the climate activists, for instance. Um, and uh, I need to reach out more to them and, and to expand the dialogue. That it's not just a result, we're not just suffering from global warming we're, 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 uh, or climate change, we're suffering from these energy driven wars that they're lying to us about. Thank you. That's it. <laughs>Is Spencer Sherman. Um, I'm the vice chair of the Libertarian Party who has organized the Rage Against the War Machine rally today and um, I think it's a it's a good place to start in a world that's so polarized by different people's opinions where everybody sort of gets so secular to share that today's event was far from that. We have groups of people from all different parts of the political spectrum, from the libertarian side to the communist side here. And we're all getting together on the idea that war is bad for humans. That this, this incessant military industrial push that really only profits a small few and doesn't really help humanity. Uh, the current war that we're concerned about is the ongoing war in Ukraine. Uh, there, there was the potential for peace before all the military industrial complex stepped in and pushed and rallied for the war machine to continue. And pretty much everybody here today is against that concept. War for profiteering, whether it was the Rockefellers just before World War II, whether it was the Bush-Cheney group during the Iraq war in Afghanistan, and now it's the, the left-wing Democrats who are rallying the banner not to let go of the war. And it just, war is hell. My dad fought in the last year of World War II in the Battle of the Bulge and in the Ruhr Valley, and our conversations about that were nothing more than horrific. And you would not want that 
you wouldn't wish it on anybody. And, and to see what's happening to a generation of Ukrainians today is equally as horrible. And the fact that it continues because we're just continuing to fund it without anyone suing for peace just seems so nonsensical to be polite. Um, so yeah, so a group of us got together from all different walks of life to try to figure out what we can do to make our voices known so that we stop funding this godforsaken war that is killing so many people. And just because they're not American soldiers dying over there doesn't mean that we shouldn't stop it. And so we as the Libertarian Party got together with some other folks and to take this opportunity at the war against the Rage Against the War Machine rally in DC and do a sister rally here in Vermont. And it was, I would say, remarkably successful because it left the po people who care a place to try to figure out how to consolidate our message and how to share it with people in such a way that hopefully more people see how ugly and evil war is and work towards ending it. So you're actually saw some progress in that, in this, in, the, in this dialogue being able to occur. I did see some progress. Um, as w I, I sort of took on the role of the moderator in my small group, um, and the hardest part was trying to get people who were emotional about the issue to focus in a single direction. Um, because emotions can often get us a little bit scattered in our thought process. But with a little bit of guidance, everybody just simply bringing it back to the concept of why we're here today. And not just every other war in the past, or, but why we're here now. And, and my heart goes out to the Ukrainian people. I have friends of Ukrainian origin who are working really hard to help feed people, among other things, and take in refugees and such. And again, war is hell. And we need to do something to end it. And that's why we were all here today. Nadia, turning it over to you. Hey everybody. Thank you, Nick. How is everyone today? This is beautiful. I mean, who can hate this country looking out at it? Look how lovely everything is around us. We have a beautiful day. If only all this were used for good instead of evil right here in the heart of the empire. Look at it. Did anyone come here to D.C. in order to get here? Did they cross state lines? Great. I love to see that because the whole point of this is to overcome barriers, not just ideological barriers or physical barriers as well, to come together and say that we're tired of this war, as many of the speakers have mentioned before me. So I'm honored to, to be here. I want to, as others have emphasized, how inspiring it is to see former presidential candidates, four of them, Dr. Jill Stein, Tulsi Gabbard, Ron Paul, and Dennis Kucinich. They each have their own flavor, but they all decided to show up today because they recognize that even though they be each come from something different, we don't always get the opportunity to come together and show what this country is actually about, which is what I see in front of me today. I'm also disappointed that there are some people who couldn't share the stage with me today. Is Scott Ritter in the audience? I want to give it up to Scott Ritter. He unfortunately couldn't speak today, but I just want to point out that more than anybody on this stage, Scott is actually someone who knows what it feels like to risk and lose everything. And he did it in order to stand up to the greatest humanitarian catastrophe so far this century, the Iraq War. So thank you, Scott. Unfortunately, even though she's back here with us, you know her and love her, I do too, Medea Benjamin, a legend of the anti-war movement. She couldn't be on stage speaking, and I don't hold that against Medea because I understand what she's up against, but what I do reject 
are the individuals and the groups who instead of asking to be a part of this or working with us, having a conversation, they invested all their time into attacking us, smearing us, in the most cynical way. And the reality is, building an anti-war movement is not about building anybody's personal vanity political project. It's not about building even necessarily individual parties. It's putting all of that together over the one umbrella of ending the war. We don't get we don't have the luxury in the grassroots when we're fighting for something to say that uh, we want to play clubhouse politics and that we want to sit in the same houses, talk to the same people that we've been talking to for, in some cases, decades, other cases, years. And everybody thinks the same, everybody looks the same. That's not fun, that's not growth, and that's definitely not building movement. So I actually think it's great that people can come together and discuss the areas where they disagree. And, you know, we can debate whether or not teenage girls should have to share locker rooms or compete in athletics against biological males another time. Because the reality is, if the people who run this country right now continue down this path, those other questions aren't even going to matter. They're not going to matter. We all know the stakes of this war. And our job at the grassroots is to understand the stakes of the war and communicate to the people the stakes of the war and the cost of the war. And I mean all the US people, regardless of what they believe in on other issues. We are all affected by this, not just in terms of the taxpayer dollar cost, I mean, we should be communicating to people that the price of gas at the pump, the price of the food they're buying right now, is all tied to this war. You think sanctioning Russia's oil means that Russia's not going to make money off their oil? No, it just means we're sanctioning ourselves, not able to buy that oil, and then suddenly the price of oil goes up. I wonder why that is. So. It's about communicating the stakes and the real cost to people who might see the war itself as abstract. But it is also, I think, about being serious about what we're actually living through right now. I hear a lot of people talk about the lead up to World War III, and that's what we're experiencing right now. Hello. I would actually argue that we're already living through World War III. Because the world war that we are going to experience, or that we are experiencing in our generation, is not is of the same nature as the world wars past. There's not trenches. The nature of the, the war is different. The battle is different. It's a hybrid war. They have economic sanctions that they levy as part of this war. They wage a media war through your mind now, not just on the television, but through social media as well. And there's a proxy war, there's a covert aspect, which is what we're seeing play out in Ukraine. Just think for a minute that it's a war between Ukraine and Russia. It's a war between the United States and Russia. And our leaders openly say it. You've heard them all. The biggest cheerleaders of sending more war to the front line in Ukraine always make this really odd point, they say, no, it actually is a good investment because we can give them the money and they'll fight the war and we don't have to. Haven't you heard that? You've heard them say it over and over again. I heard Hillary Clinton say it. I heard Lindsey Graham make it. And the people who say that, they are so demented because they are openly stating that their whole vision for the war is dependent on their ability to send every last Ukrainian father, son, brother, friend, onto the front line. They are happy to fight to the death of the last Ukrainian. The United States is. And so standing here and organizing something like this is actually the real way to stand up for Ukrainian lives because the war, they're the ones suffering the most. And so that's why it is up to us to be serious about communicating the stakes and the cost 
And just to point out one more time that the same system that is responsible for the train derailment in Ohio where a corporation and the government basically now have nuked entire U.S. city. It's the same system that blew up the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, creating the greatest environmental catastrophe of my lifetime. It's a corporate, oligarchical system. It's a militarist system. It's evil and it's rotten to the core. And when we are clear about those objectives and about the stakes, it's not hard to put away our differences and to come together and rage against the war machine. So thank you all for doing it. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you to Nick and Angela once again. And no more war!